the book of Colossians, the book of Colossians chapter 3. And while you're turning, I want to remind you that we're actually going to uh, be finishing up next week uh, on this particular group of messages called Extreme Makeover Home Edition. And uh, next week we'll be uh, kind of addressing ourselves to, uh, to you fellas, to the dads, to the husbands, and um, we'll be uh, finishing up kind of bringing it all together next week. And so today, though, we want to finish up uh, regarding this, this uh, issue of conflict, and we want to talk about resolving it. It, it is one of those kind of things that uh, happens to so many of us, happens for all of us, and it's something that uh, we really do need to see what God's Word would have to say regarding it. And so in Colossians chapter 3, verses 15 through 17, this is what the Scripture says. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you, with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks through him to God the Father. It was Robert Louis Stevenson who, uh, Stevenson who said, Marriage is like one long conversation checkered by daily disputes. Even in life's grandest pursuits, there is the potential for conflict. And marriage is really no exception to that rule. Uh, conflict is sort of a common denominator for all of us in regard to marriage and family and the home and so on. Every relationship has its fair share of sparks and rumbles. The reason is because we're all created differently. Truth of the matter is that we are created different by design. It is not something that just happens accidentally. It is not something where uh, God just sort of makes this you know, cookie-cutter design and we're all sort of cut out of the same lump of clay or same lump of dough. Now, the truth is that we're all created uniquely and distinctly different. We are different by design. And because we are different, that means that we're going to have clashes and conflict from time to time. The other reason is that because uh, we're, we're all imperfect people, we're not without error. Two essentially self-centered lives cannot merge into one without facing a, a, multiple, um, a multiplicity of challenges, a plethora of challenges. Temperaments are going to clash, egos are going to get engaged, personalities are going to collide, and conflict is going to arise. Without a doubt, conflict is going to be inevitable in every single marriage. But while conflict is inevitable in marriage, my encouragement to you is this. It is not terminal. That simply means it won't kill you and it does not have to kill your marriage. It doesn't have to be fatal. Conflict can be overcome in every marriage. And the good news is that a lot of our conflict can be avoided altogether if we simply apply some of the biblical uh, principles that are, are delineated and outlined for us in the Word of God. And so what I want you to do this morning is I want you to look to your, if your husband or wife is close by, I want you to turn to them and I want you to look to them and I want you to tell them he's preaching to me today. All right, you go ahead and tell him he's preaching to me today. Because the tendency is when you talk about conflict, and you talk about, uh, you know, uh, anger and, 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 and you know, getting, getting upset with one another. And you talk about those things. The tendency is to think, well, preacher, you give it to her today. Or you let him have it today. I mean, you just did. Well, what I want you to know is really what we're going to talk about is principles that are for you. They're for you. They're for me. They're not for them. So think about it as if man alive, he's preaching to me today. Now, remember where we came from. What we've been doing over the last couple of weeks is we've been talking about this thing of extreme makeover, kind of like the show that, that existed several years ago. 
was on TV. And they always started out at the very beginning by just acknowledging you got to get rid of the whole thing. You got to get rid of it. You got to do a transformation. And so you remember how they would walk in and they would say, we're going to just demolish the whole thing. They're going to send them to Disney World for a couple of weeks or whatever, and they're going to do it in that period of time. And so we started this process. And when we started a couple of weeks ago, we started by saying, okay, you got to accept the fact that a change is needed. There may be a room, there may be a spot, there may be a, the whole thing, but you got to deal with the whole thing. Get rid of the old Bring in the new. That's, and the only way to do that is let God build the house. And that's what the scripture says. And then what we did from there is we kind of walked along through several of the rooms. We kind of have made a journey through several of the rooms. We went to the family room. We went to the kids' room. Uh, we kind of went in the office where you pay your bills or whatever the case may be. And now we're kind of in the bedroom where, you know, parents sometimes, you know, moms and dads, husbands and wives, they, they, they get into some heated discussions. I mean, conflict can arise. And so this morning, we're going to kind of finish up uh, in there, and then next week, we'll finish up by talking about uh, husbands and dads and so on, and uh, our place in leading our families and so on. Now, this morning, we're going to be in Colossians chapter 3. In Colossians chapter 3, what we're actually looking at is something that Paul does in terms of uh, addressing uh, relationships that we have with people in general. In other words, he's, he's drawing a distinction between the old life that we have outside of Christ, and the new life that we do have in Christ. The life apart from Jesus and the life that we now have in Jesus, and with Jesus as the center of our lives. And he says, now, this is what your life ought to look like before you have a relationship. Uh, 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 this is what it looks like before you have a relationship with Jesus, but this is what it looks, ought to look like after you have, after you become related to him. And he actually outlines some guiding principles that really ought to govern our conduct as Christian believers, as Christians. And, and they ought to govern our conduct in all relationships of life. So this really doesn't just apply at home. It really applies at all levels of living. Anytime you're talking about interpersonal relationship, these relationships, these principles apply. But they particularly apply and they start at the house between a husband and a wife, in between our relationship with each other. And quite frankly, that's the way, you, what you're going to find is as we look at this, these are the things that you can do to resolve conflict in your home. And for that matter, you can, you can govern your entire life according to these principles. And so if you're a Christian, you really ought to act like one. And that's really what he's describing here. So what I want us to do is just simply look at a couple of these principles, these two or three principles and get a feel for how you can resolve conflict, particularly in your home. How you can sort of stay the hand of a stalemate in your home. And so one of the principles for resolving conflict, for sort of guarding against gridlock, if you will, in your home, is let the peace of God rule your heart. Let the peace of God rule your heart. Now, now listen to what he said in verse 15. He said, let the peace of Christ rule rule in your hearts. Now, peace is one of those coveted commodities that a lot of us would like to have around our homes. Um, you know, there's a lot of folks I know would do just about anything if they could get just a little bit of peace at the house. I had a fellow tell me one time, he said, man, if, if only our home could be at peace again, because there was no peace. They were always at one another. There was this there was this, they had completely, the husband and wife had completely lost respect for one another. And so they talked to one another like sailors, and they acted like they were elementary kids to one another. There was no respect for one another. And so because of that, there was no peace in the home. And so he said, man, if we could just have peace in our home again. And so what do we mean when we talk about letting the peace of God rule our heart? Well, that phrase, the peace of God, actually has a couple of different connotations when you really begin to look at it and think about it from the Scripture's perspective. Uh, on one, on, on, from one perspective, on one hand, it's a reference to that calm confidence that's deep within you. Uh, it's that quiet solitude that, that settles in on the midst of, you know, those tough times of life or whatever the case may be. It's, it's, it's kind of like the submarine that's below the, the, the wind-driven waves at the surface, and it's kind of down below, underneath, in those tranquil waters. And, and so it's the idea of God just coming along and settling you in the midst of those difficult times. It's a calm 
confidence, a deep down inner solitude where you know that you know that even though the wind's blowing and the storms are raging, that you're in the belly of the ocean where the waters are calm and the waters are tranquil. That, that it's, that, it's that inner solitude. So that's one meaning that this idea of the peace of God has. And that's one way it's used. However, there's another way, and in this case, that's really what it's talking about. And it's, it's in a relational way. It's in an interpersonal way. And it's, it's used with a view toward other people, toward uh, other individuals. And, and that's the way he's using it here. He's talking about a peacefulness, a peacefulness, an absence of conflict, that personal resolve to agree to disagree. To have a, a little bit of unity, whether you have uniformity or not. To have unity. It's that, it's that overarching will that you have that says no matter what the difference may be, there's still going to be an attitude of unity. There's still going to be a peacefulness between us. Now, that's the problem. The problem's not that we can't agree. The problem is that we don't know how to agree to disagree. And that happens between every married couple. And what happens is a lot of times we come into it not ever having been taught how to do that. So we come in with our own agendas and our own expectations and our own idiosyncrasies and all of our selfish wants and desires and ways. We come into marriage and we never get that changed. And so what we've got to figure out is how do you agree to disagree and still have peace between you? We let, the problem is, I think, a lot of times, we, we let our pride get in the way. And before long, we're not really arguing about, you know, whether or not that old sorry joker squeezing the toothpaste in the middle or not, or whether he's doing it at the end. But instead, we, we cross the line and we start arguing in order to win a fight. And we cross the line. We forget about the toothpaste, which may have been the impetus, but then it becomes a fight to be right. You know, you're really arguing in order to come out on top. Who's going to have the better argument? Who's going to outwit the other? Who's going to outlast the other? Who's going to talk the longest? In other words, it's about winning an argument then. And we cross the line because pride gets all caught up in there. And that's what selfishness really looks like. Self is always thinking about me before it is you. Self is always about me and what's mine and what I want and what I like. Self has always got to be right. It's always got to look better. And it's always got to end up ahead of everybody else that comes against it. Most of the time, it's critical, it's condemning, it's blaming, it's argumentative, it's unapologetic, and it's judgmental. And most of the time, when we start fussing and fighting... That's really what it's uh, 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 all about. It's really more about us wanting what we want, wanting our way, wanting what we're about. And so that's why Paul says, let the peace of God, the peacefulness, that attitude that says what's most important is about our relationship. What's most important is a relationship, not the little picky, unish, petty preferences that we often get in arguments over peacefulness, that personal resolve to maintain unity and harmony, uh, uh, and harmony and let that rule your heart. And so that's why Paul says, let the peace of God reign. Now, that's what his, that's what his encouragement is. That's what his word to us is. But notice what he says. He says, let the peace of God rule. So take note of that word. The word rule is an athletic word. Paul took it from the athletic world in those days. And it's the idea of letting it be the umpire of your life. Now, an umpire is a judge. An umpire is the one who makes the call when a dispute or a disagreement comes up. And so that's what Paul is saying we need to do in our homes and in our marriages. He's saying we need to let the peace of God. Now, listen, we need to let the peace of God, that peacefulness, be the judge, be the umpire of our lives. We need to let his peace be the umpire. We need to let his peace call the shots when matters of controversy, when matters of disagreement and dispute 
raise up between us. You, you see, the people who have the most trouble with peace between them and other people are those who have the most trouble with peace within their own hearts. The reason we're at peace, uh, we're at conflict, we're at war with so many other people or with our husbands and wives, it's because there is war within your own heart. James says the source of our quarrels is the war that's within ourselves. Maybe the problem is you're not at peace with God yourself. If, if, you see, you can't have the peace of God if you're not at peace with God. If you, if you don't have the peace with God, then you're going to stay angry all the time. You're going to stay mad at your husband and wife all the time. They won't ever be able to do anything to make you happy. They won't ever be able to do anything to make you feel better. You know why? Because the issue's not what they do or don't do. The issue's in your own heart. Your life, your marriage will be all about what you want. It'll all be about what you like and what you think and what benefits you. And anytime everything is all about you, there is going to be a peace problem between your husband or your wife and you listen to what the bible says the bible says blessed are the peace makers blessed are the peacemakers now if you're going to make peace sometimes crow is the only thing that's on the menu and there's a lot of ways that you can cook crow you can broil it, you can fry it, you can bake it, you can roast it. But there's one thing that's true about crow, and that is that any way you cook it, it never tastes good. And the person who is ruled by peace recognizes that he's not always right. And that he doesn't have the market cornered on truth. And so when those moments of controversy or disagreement arises and things don't go your way, you just let the peace of God, you let the peacefulness call the shots for you. Sometimes you just got to hunker down and you got to wage the war of peace between you and your husband or you and your wife. But in order to do that, you got to get over yourself got to get over you and until you resolve you and your pride and your selfishness and your fleshliness until you reside uh, resolve that you're going to have a hard time allowing peace to rule your heart one of the principles that the bible gives us not just for our homes not just for husband and wife relationship but for all of our relationships is let the peace of God be the umpire that calls the shots rather than you. Peacefulness is what he's talking about. Now, there's a second principle that he gives us here. And that is not only let the peace of God rule your hearts, but notice in verse 16, he tells us that we're to let the word of God dwell in our hearts. Listen to what he said. Let the word of Christ richly dwell in within you now that word dwell means that you gotta that it means to settle down it means to take up a place of residency in you to take up a place of permanency in you it's a reference to the entire teaching of jesus it's the idea of the whole of the christian faith and christian teaching paul says let that word all that jesus taught and lived and dwelled let it all of that, let all of that dwell in you. Let it take up a place of residency within you. Let it become a, at home in your life so much so that you don't know where one starts and the other stops. Now, can you imagine if we started doing this in our lives? Can you imagine if we just let the peace of God call the shots of our lives and we let the word of God take up a place of permanent residency in our lives? Can you imagine what would happen in our relationships 
Can you imagine how many fights and arguments in churches would never have happened if the people had just let the peace of God reign and the word of God dwell within them? Man alive, it would have changed the course of history in so many instances if we had just done that. Well, let me tell you something. It'll also change the course of your life, of your marriage. You know what would happen? All of a sudden, principles would start taking priority over personal preference. All of a sudden, we'd stop fussing and fighting over opinions and over the little things that we want, and instead, you'd be more interested in those things that were real, that were legitimate, that were biblical values and principles. And see, that's the problem with most of the, stu uh, most of the stuff that we fuss and fight over anyway. And I think most of us know this. Most of the stuff that we spend most of our time arguing about in the grand scheme of eternity, does not amount to a hill of beans. I mean, think about it. Now, just think about this with me. Reckon God really gives a rip that you squeeze the toothpaste at the end and she squeezes it at the middle? I mean, think God really cares about her pantyhose hanging there over the shower curtain or whether or not you're going to eat at the Longhorn or the Sizzling tonight? I mean, how many fights have most of us gotten into over where we're going to eat tonight? I mean, do you think that God really cares? Are we violating any scriptural principle in going to the Longhorn? I mean, reckon God looks out over heaven and say, well, I wish you'd look at there. They're having steak and fries tonight instead of the buffet. Gregory, God really even cares? And see, that's the problem. Most of the stuff that we fuss and fight over doesn't even add up to a thin dime when you weigh it all out in the grand scheme of eternity. Most of it's just not even important. But we keep right on arguing about it because we don't ever stop long enough to try to apply this Bible to it. You know why? Because we're not thinking about Bible, we're thinking about self. We're thinking about us. We're thinking about what we want. We're thinking about our way, what our desire is. Why is it that we will argue day in and day out? We will cut each other back and forth with insult after insult because that old joker won't put the soap back in the right soap dish and we will go to divorce court and we will call it irreconcilable differences but when it comes to the principles of the word of God, we will not even open our mouth. Why is it we won't fight for something that's worth fighting for? Why don't we ever get all hot and bothered over the kind of things that God himself gets hot and bothered over? You see, you've got to learn what's worth fighting for and what's not. And let me tell you, 90% of what most of us fight for and fight about every week hadn't got a, an inch of meaning to it when you weigh it out in comparison to what God says is really important in life. If you want to resolve the conflict in your home, or that matter with anybody else, let the peace of God rule your heart. And let the word of God so dwell within you Take up a place of residency within you so much so that you literally don't know where you start and the other stops. That when you discuss, when you convey truth, when you talk with one another, you talk through the filter of the word of God. It'll change the way you interact with people. It'll change the way that you interact with one another. Third, he says, let the peace of God rule. Let the word of God dwell. And then last, let the glory of God guide your heart. Let the glory of God guide your heart. Listen to what he said in verse 17. Whatsoever you do. Now, what it, what's that word? What's that first word? For those couple of things that you do. Every now and then for those things that might come along. Whatsoever that you do, in word or in deed, how are we to do it? It better be for the glory of Christ. 
It's to be for his glory. Did you know every time you go to your business or your job or the place that you work, you work both for and with a company that bears a name? A name is your authority for doing something. When I was in the banking world, you know, I had titles. And those titles gave me the authority to do certain things, to have access to certain things. You know, as a pastor, you have a title, and that allows you to do certain things that others might not be able to. A name is your authority for doing something. But not only is it your authority for doing something, it's your reason for doing something. You do what you do that that company or that boss that bears that name might be extended or advanced in some way. So a name is both your badge and it's your reason for doing what you do. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we bear a name. And it's our reason for what we do. And that name is a Christian. We are Christ ones. Now, all of us bear the name that we were born with. And all of us have made a name for ourselves by the way that we've lived and the things that we've done. But some of us have taken on another name, just like wives take on other names, take on the husband's name. Well, we've taken on another name, and that name is the name of Christ. Christ one. And I want you to know there is no sweeter name. There's not a name on this earth or earth to come there's, that's any more rich or any more wonderful or noble than the name of Jesus. The Bible says he, he's got a name that's above every other name. And that name is both our badge and it is our reason for what we do. And because of that, everything we do, whether it be in word or whether it be in deed, ought to be done to bring glory. It ought to be done to, to elevate and to honor Jesus Christ. And I want you to know, if all you know how to do is to pick and to fuss and to argue and to bicker about every little thing that doesn't go your way at your house, then you're not doing anything in this world to bring glory to the name of Jesus. If every other day you ladies are just pouting about something else, or every other day you fellows are just shouting about something else, then the glory of God is not guiding your life, you are. And I want to tell you something, that makes you for a very miserable person. Not only for you to live with, but for other people to live with. Let me tell you how you can bring glory to the name of Jesus in your home. As it relates to this thing of conflict resolution. Give you a couple of quick principles. Number one, take a team approach. Take a team approach. Can I tell you this? You're not against one another. God didn't put you together as a husband and wife to be against one another. God meant for us to see our homes as fortresses. They're not, they're not meant to be battlegrounds. They're safety zones. They're not war zones where the devil and the world will try to beat your doors down. God intended for you and me as husbands and wives to stand together, to, to fight together, not against one another. And so... If you want to resolve conflict and you want to bring glory to the name of Christ in your marriage and, and deal with this issue of conflict that's always arising, always remember that you're a team. You're two that has become one. You're not against one another. You are for one another. Second, be willing to lose often in order to win even more often. Be willing to lose sometimes. Jerry Spence, a professional marriage counselor, uh, marriage counselor, said when couples surrender their desires in the interest of serving each other, they will diffuse the battle for control that secretly lurks behind most confrontations. He said in this way, losing, ironically, becomes the path to winning for both parties. You see, there are times when two rights make a wrong. And that's when two strong-willed individuals are so convinced that they're right that they wouldn't dare back up if Jesus himself said back up. There are times in your life and in your marriage when you back up and you allow a loss for the sake of a win. Third principle. Commit yourself to using 
the right words. The Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 21, that there is power of, uh, in words. There is the power of life and there is the power of death in words, in the tongue. And so avoid these words where you're always talking about, you know, I told you so. Or I knew I was right. Or you should have listened to me. Or you never tell me. Or I hate it when you. Or you're just like your mom or your daddy. Or I wish I'd never met you. But let me tell you, those words aren't good words to use. Because they're fighting words. They're argumentative. They're accusatory. And you're just building for yourself a battle. If you want to bring glory to the name of Christ in your home. And cut down on this gridlock that, that occurs. And, 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 and this stalemate that occurs. And this argumentative environment that exists all of the time. Take a team approach. Remember you're two that's become one. You're a team now. You're for each other. Not against one another. Be willing to lose sometimes in order to win for the sake of the marriage. Commit yourself to using and saying those things that will bring life, not death. And resolve your anger. Resolve your own anger. Sometimes you need to say, I was wrong. Sometimes you need to say, I'm sorry. See, a lot of us know how to stir the pot problem is we don't know how to calm the storm. You want to know how you calm the storm? Some storm stoppers? Here they are. I'm telling you, you'll stop a storm. When you say, honey, I was wrong. Or when you say, I'm sorry for what I said. Or when you say, will you forgive me for what I said? Or, or I love you. See, these are storm stoppers. Now all of a sudden you just diffused. Now you've just de-escalated. And now you've made it possible to communicate and to have a conversation and to reduce conflict. But you've got to resolve your anger. Anger is always born whenever conflict is internalized rather than resolved. Do you know most of marital conflict finds its source in anger over something that happened or didn't happen the way we wanted it to in the past? It's like the old fella who was talking about him and his wife and their argumentative and, and the old fellow said every time me and my wife argue you know she gets historical the other fellow said you mean hysterical he said no I mean historical every time we argue she brings up everything I've ever done wrong and that happens there's a lot of husbands and there are a lot of wives who always go back to something else or either it's something else that's the real issue most of the stuff we argue about, most of the time, doesn't have anything to do with what we're arguing about. Most of the time, it's about some little old thing that happened two, three days ago, or two, three weeks ago, or two, three months ago, or two, three years ago that hurt us or didn't meet our expectations. And so we're arguing out of that. That's why they say that marital conflict's like an iceberg. It's light at the top, but it's heavy underneath. You see an iceberg floating on the water. You're not really seeing that iceberg. You're only seeing about 10 to 20% of it. The 80 to 90% of it's underneath. Well, if you've pushed those, those hurts down somewhere, and you've pushed those heartaches down somewhere, and those disappointments down somewhere inside of you, and you never resolve those things instead of dealing with them, then somewhere along the way, they've turned from hurts and heartaches to anger, and now you're just running around all the bases backwards trying to catch up to where you never dealt with a long time ago. And everybody around you suffering because of it. You've got to resolve your anger. Be willing to use the right kind of words. Lose sometimes in order to win. And take a team approach. You're on the same team. And you know what? I believe when we do these kind of things, I believe God gets the glory. And we honor that name that name that is above every other name. Let the peace of God rule your heart. Let the word of God dwell in your heart. And let the glory of God guide your heart. One of the great geometric principles of life is this. 
that things equal to the same thing are also equal to each other. And so when it comes to marriage, when two people are properly related to Jesus Christ and to His Word, they will then be properly related to each other. And so how do you relate to the Word of God this morning, to the peace of God and to the glory of God? Conflict may be inevitable, but it is not terminal. You can overcome it. You can defeat it. You can learn how to live with one another in a way that, that enhances the glory of God and enhances your relationship. So whatever it is, and it may not have anything to do with this today, but maybe God's been putting his finger on some things in your life as we've talked about this thing of extreme makeover. And so maybe today you say, gosh, that's, that's, that's what God would have me respond to. And so in just a moment, we're going to sing, and that's going to be the time you respond to as God leads. Father God, we thank you for the opportunity to study. We thank you for the opportunity to open the word. We thank you, Lord, for the reminders and the encouragement that while there may certainly be an inevitability in this thing of conflict, it is not something that's fatal. It doesn't have to lead to divorce. It doesn't have to lead to uh, distance or separation. It doesn't have to lead to any of that. God, I just pray that we'll get ourselves out of the way, and that we'll let the Word of God dwell within us, the peace of God rule within us the glory of God for us. Lord, we love you and we thank you for what you're doing and for this group of messages and we pray that it will change each one of us from the inside out and make us better husbands and wives and parents to your glory and honor. We pray in Christ's name.